Hello community, welcome to Beyond Graph Neural Networks. And you might ask, hey, why? Why if we go beyond? We love our GNNs. We have the link prediction task. We have our powerhouse message parsing. And why should we go beyond? Well, let me give you four reasons. It has to do with the optimal space for the embedding. It has to do with similar features on your graph. It has to do with the graph system in itself being a dyadic system. And it has to do with message parsing where the number of layers you have either underreach or over smoothening. So where do we begin? We begin with videos. And if you're not familiar with graph embedding, I have two videos for you. One is on the theory you have here, big smiley, graph embedding, and the other video is on coding in Deep Graph Library, or if you prefer PyTorch uh, Geographic, I show you the code for message parsing in DGL. But let's go back and have a very short overview. Now, the graph, as you know, is both an input and a computational structure. And GNN used the input graph to propagate information, thus obtaining a representation that reflects both the structure of the graph, yes, and its feature. Now, some graphs turn out to be less optimal, nasty, for information propagation due to certain structural characteristics. We call those the bottlenecks. And as you know, modern GNN cope with this by decoupling the input graph from the computational graph, a technique known as graph rewiring. Now, if you know about graph sage, you know rewiring can be neighborhood sampling, or if you go for transformer and attention type GNN, you know that you effectively learn a new graph by assigning a different weight to each edge, kind of a soft rewiring and a lot of other methodologies. Now, if you want to know more about this, and if you want to know my sources, here is a very short literature. The specific article I read and I decided to do a video was by Michael Bronstein, Beyond Message Passing, a Physics-Inspired Paradigm for Graph Neural Networks, published in The Gradient 2022. Of course, message passing all the way up from 2022, Pietra Velikovic, and then you have homophiling graph neural networks, limitation graph attention networks, and the Bible, if my colleagues call it the blueprint of Bronstein. If you want to know about geometric deep learning grids, groups, graphs, geodetic, and gorgeous, well, this is the, the, the Bible for you, but let's just jump right into the topic. Yeah, of course, you, we are not only focused on message passing, you can also have here a representation learning framework based on the path for link prediction. And I have a very short video on the extension of the Belmont Ford, the neural Belmont Ford algorithm. But this was just here to give you a hint that there are a lot of possibilities for you. Now, here, a short introduction. What is the best material I personally encounter to learn from? And it is from Stanford. It's a free class. And now for some course material I personally can recommend because I did this course is Machine Learning with Graph Stanford Fall 2021. If you're interested in January 2023, there is a new course. And what I can tell you, the instructor and the course assistants are just top notch. You have all the course materials free of charge. You can have a look at this. You have the whole material. And for each lectures, you can download your slides or from the older courses, the slides. You have, if there's some coding exercise, you have the Python notebooks here. The Colab notebooks are available free of charge for you. You can follow along. You can have beautiful interactions. And when the course is finished, so as a little bit of a time delay, you find each and every lecture here on YouTube as a long YouTube video where you can really follow along. So maybe you start if you want to have the visual and the audio experience with the recording here of CS224 in YouTube. Just go and search for Stanford 
all 2021 and you for all these beautiful lectures. Thank you and back to the main presentation. So welcome back to the presentation. If you want to know about graph neural networks, yes, I have another video coming from the graph kernels from Wasserstein distance and Weisweiler Lehmann uh, tests where you can see the transition from graph kernels to graph neural networks. But maybe the first publication I found on graph neural network is an IEEE presentation from January 2009. And even there you see it implements a function that maps a graph and its nodes into a lower dimensional Euclidean space. And if you look at the next slide, you can see here, you have here a, a node, a middle node, L1, and you have the other nodes, L2, L3, L4, and L6, and you have here the definition of the neighborhood of a node. And for node classification, we need, of course, the information about the environments of nodes to predict the label of maybe some unlabeled nodes. And we have to learn it learns to represent each node with a d-dimensional, lower dimensional vector, which contains, of course, the information of its neighborhood. Now, regarding this embedding in a lower dimensional space, and you might say, yes, finally, a low dimensional vector space. We have all the tools for this. Beautiful. You know that graph embedding is an approach that is used to transform nodes, edges, and their feature into a vector space, a lower dimensional vector space, while preserving the properties like graph structure, the connectivity, and the information content. And now let's start with the main part here. It is about group, and it is about symmetry and the topology of the underlying space that the data is attached to. Now, graph, it's rather easy. The symmetry of the domain underlying the data in graphs is, of course, node permutation. There's no specific order for nodes. And message passing neural networks operating locally on the graph must rely on permutation invariant feature aggregation functions. So you know we have here this beautiful interplay of a group structure, of symmetry, of course, then symmetry groups. But what I want to tell you, what is our stepping stone that we go beyond classical graph neural network is the genome computations are driven by the topology of the underlying space that the data is attached to. And this is a sentence I did not understand for quite some long time, but it is really, really important that the topology of the underlying space is one of the reasons why we can evolve. So let me show you four problems why I decided to do it. Now, first, the quality of the graph embedding and the ability to convey the structure of the graph crucially depends on the geometry of the embedding space. And of course, its compatibility with the geometry of the graph. Now, Euclidean spaces, as much as I love them, they can be a poor choice if you have a natural graph. One of the reasons for this, and this is thanks to some insight I read from Michael Bronstein, is that the volume growth of the Euclidean metric balls is polynomial in the radius, but exponential in the dimension. Now, in our real-world graph manifests exponential volume growth, and as a result, the embeddings become too crowded, forcing the use of high-dimensional embedding spaces. But this high-dimensional embedding spaces is something we do not want, because why should we add dimension if we do not need them, and it comes with higher computational complexity, higher computational cost, you have a higher space complexity. So there we can identify problem number one. Problem number two, more or less the same. The GNN struggles when the data structure is not compatible with the underlying graph structure. What does this mean? Now, in many graph training data sets or learning data sets, like for example in the core data set, if you're familiar with, then you have this tacit assumption that the features or the labels of adjacent nodes are similar. Now, this is something you have in a training data set. This is beautiful. Works well on this simple training data set. But 
if you go out in the real world, you have disappointing results when dealing with heterophilic data, which are more nuanced aggregation is than required. And it can happen to you that the model ignores neighborhood information altogether if there's not a certain degree, a certain kind of similarity in the features or labels of adjacent nodes. Problem number two. Now, what is really important if you work, for example, in chemistry or, or pharma or bio, that you remember graph. Graphs are per definition dyadic. This means pairwise. You have two vertices and you have an edge that connects two vertices. Yes, you can have 1000 vertices, but remember, if you build a graph, think about the dimensionality of the graph. Now, for us it is important in the application area, you cannot represent relations and interaction involving more than two objects. Now, this is a real hard limitation. So, this could be a problem in modeling complex system characterized by higher order interactions. So, for instance, if you have three enzymes in a chemical reaction, you will run into troubles. And this problem also indicates something. I have a short visualization for you. Please forgive me for the simplicity, but this is what I have. I want to show you the importance of the topological space. And here we go. If you think about the dimensionality of your graph, it is easy to say, hey, well, n-dimensional graphs, I can just jump up the dimension. I have 100,000 data points. I uh, have all my vectors, 1 million vectors whatsoever. But think about it. We have one vertex as an element. We have an edge as an element. And these are our two elements we construct a graph from. Now, as you can see here in this video, have a look at the overall dimensionality of this construct. You see what I mean? And of course, if you have now the technical implementation, and here we are now with problem number four, you know that message passing GNNs require n layers to make nodes that are n hops away communicate with each other. So therefore, if you use just a little bit too few layers, nodes that are further apart cannot exchange messages. This is a phenomenon we know as underreaching. And in contrast, using too many layers could lead to oversmoothing. And even messages could even get lost in structural bottlenecks, as I showed you before, of our graph. So you see, there is a good reason that Michael Bronstein and his team, his colleagues, his co-workers, his co-publishers um, tried to make another step. And this is a beautiful step, but it requires a little bit of algebraic topology to really understand what's going on. And you might say, what? You leave us here with these little sentences hidden away here at the lower part of the screen? And what does it say? It say cell complexes. So we are here in mathematical uh, algebraic topology, if you want, may alleviate these problems because the richer neighborhood structure induced by a higher dimensional cell structure itself. This creates shortcuts between nodes that can even be far apart. Now, let's have a look at this in detail in my next video. This is just to tell you there is a solution. Some geniuses, some professors of mathematics have been able to figure out actually more than one solution. And let me show you one solution of algebraic topology in my next video. See you then.